Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Leveraging Data to Manage Remote Working in UK Local Government, with Softcat, Liverpool City Council, Splunk, and AWS Marketplace. Today, we have three great speakers, our very own Dean Gardner, the Chief Technologist for Data at Softcat, Alison Hughes, the Assistant IT Director for Liverpool City Council, and Kev Pryat, the Local Government Solutions Engineer for Splunk. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that you can submit any questions at any time during the webinar using the Q&A tool that you can see on the console. And all being well, we'll take the time to go through that and answer those questions at the end of the session. You should also be able to see some helpful resources on the right-hand side and our speaker buyers on the left-hand side for your perusal. You can minimize and reopen and resize the widget showing on the screen if you wanted to. We do want to highlight that the media player widget on the top left side will be showing a video within this webinar, um, and it will maximize when it's playing and then minimize once it's finished. So make sure to keep an eye, keep an eye out and keep that open for you so you don't miss it. We will also, um, we did also want to let you know that there will be a recording of the webinar emailed to you by tomorrow. Um, and if you have any questions following the event, please speak to your Softcat account manager or email marketing at softcat.com if you don't already have a direct contact. I will now pass over to you, Dean, to start the webinar. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, everyone, and thanks, Anna. Um, first of all, um, I'll just introduce Softcat and who we are to AWS and Splunk. Um, and as you can see on the screen, um, we are a consultant partner or consulting partner. We've been doing this for a while now. Um, we've really invested a lot of resource and te into technical resource over the last 12 months to build up that a AWS capability. Um, we're probably Splunk's number one partner in the UK at the moment as well. Um, and just kind of going through our capabilities, um, we have a rich AWS. AWS services portfolio where we assess design and we obviously deliver solutions into AWS for our customers. We do things like landing zone deployments, et cetera. Um, and then when it feeds into operations and support, we do a fair amount of optimization and billing, specifically a lot of work with public sector customers today to help them manage those costs and optimize what they're doing in AWS. Um, and then we are heavily moving into this area, this, this evolving and um, fast growing area of transacting through AWS marketplace. And, and we obviously work with Splunk and a lot of our work with Splunk is around building that solution picture with AWS where we help organizations transact the Splunk um, portfolio through the AWS marketplace. I think it says we're number one globally. I, I believe we're number one in EMEA. That might have changed slightly. It's a, obviously a, a fluctuating uh, uh, number of, 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 of partners doing that, but we are number one certainly in EMEA at the moment. Um, and we also do things like well-architected. So if you're already using AWS, we work with AWS to ensure that you're utilizing uh, the technologies in the right way, you're architected to best practice, you're secure, and, and how you manage your data is critical. We do that as part of our service service offering. And one of the areas that we're really focusing on at the moment is um, that large spend commit that AWS provide um, options for our customers where they can commit to a a AWS on EDPs, that's enterprise discount programs. And we work as um, with, with our companies to help negotiate essentially what those discounts can be based on committed spend. But this is where it really gets um, quite important. Um, if you're transacting Splunk as an example through Marketplace, if you go into commit to an EDP with AWS long term and get access to discounts. One of the things that we're really working with certainly public sector organizations on is being able to burn down the EDP with that marketplace transaction. So you can really leverage and get access to greater discounts um, as part of that EDP commit, which which is actually quite important when you obviously you're looking at bringing AWS into uh, your environment as, a, as, as, a, as a, an important platform. And we're doing a fair bit of that at the moment with some large enterprise public sector accounts. Um, and obviously, we're a technical competency partner. We have a storage competency coming and we have a roadmap of other competencies that we're um, obtaining over the next 12 months. And we just see our partnership with AWS and certainly our partnership with Splunk as critical uh, to our, all our customers' um, cloud transformation and cloud journeys. So I'm going to talk a bit, I'm going to give you a history lesson, I guess. So um, I'm first of all going to bring up this picture of this gentleman here. This is uh, Jeremy Bentham. So so creating a surface uh, panopticon. So what does this mean? Um, 
ultimately it's a metaphor again, ultimately. But what we saw in the 18th century is Jeremy Bentham created this concept of uh, a panopticon where a central tower was put in the middle of in, an institution, and in this case, a prison. Let's just call it a prison. And in that prison, was a, it was a circular prison, and the tower was in the middle, and there were cells essentially all around. And the idea was that this tower with a watchman um, basically shone a light into each one of those cells. And the key thing here was that all of the people in those cells or in that institution, they were aware they were being observed. And essentially what that did, that drove behavior um, in a way that was positive. It wasn't controlling, it was just indicating that those um, individuals were being observed. And so the, the idea was that you couldn't obviously look and see every single person, but ultimately you could give an indication that that particular person or individual was being observed and ultimately drive some improved behaviors and also start analyzing that information in a much more effective way to help do things proactively. So the idea is, is that it was almost the first point of, 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 of surveillance to a point, but it was more observability. And the key thing is we're moving into this world of observability when we come to um, our technology and what's happening in our society, you know, with devices and how people work with their technology. And ultimately observability now is becoming a critical success factor when organizers, organizations are moving to um, AWS and using um, multiple different platforms and services, now having that central tower in that, um, in, in that picture is critical. And Splunk, to a point, works as that central tower where it helps organizations with cloud migrations. It helps organizations with observing serverless platforms and looking at your containers. It kind of sits in the middle of all of that and obviously gives really valuable insights as a collection point, but ultimately having that observability piece that looks at all of those components is critical. And so why should you create this model for your strategy? Well, ultimately, you need to consolidate in some cases what you're doing around management monitoring and observability should be your, your push, having that central piece of the tower that looks at everything around what you do from an IT perspective. You need to kind of um, ensure that your boundaries and responsibilities are being shared, that people are aware that those things are being observed and that there's a proactive nature as to the reasons as to why you're doing that. Um, and as things move out of the data center, just the traditional data center into cloud and as people consume more services in a different way from um, from SaaS providers, et cetera, you need to have something that has touch points. So having something like Splunk as that, that, that tower in the middle is critical. And ultimately we're moving towards better collaboration with those individuals and the services that are being provided. And ultimately you're trying to build a proactive prediction and um, prevention model, which allows you to do, um, as opposed to react to problems, you're being proactive in trying to foresee those issues. And ultimately having the data, having services that are spread out in multiple locations and having that control tower, in this case, Splunk in the middle, is critical to be able to take ownership and kind of provide that observability platform that ultimately we're seeing as really important as part of people's cloud strategy and their roadmap. So that's kind of my metaphor into why um, something like Splunk is critical when you're moving and using and consuming cloud services. Um, and we're going to go, we've got a couple of examples today. We've got uh, Alison on next to talk about um, an example, uh, a customer example, and then obviously we've got the Splunk team on afterwards kind of going through their portfolio. So that's me, that's Softcat in the equation, and hopefully that gives you some insights in terms of how we can help you with AWS and Splunk and, and hopefully a nice little history lesson. Um, and over to Alison. Thanks for that. Good morning, everybody. I am so relieved. I've had them digging up my road for the last seven days, and they finally packed up their little blue barriers and all of their equipment yesterday. So I'm relishing the sound of silence outside my house. It's absolutely fantastic. And the last thing I wanted today when I'm doing a webinar was the sound of them digging up. So the relief, I can't tell you. So I currently am Assistant Director of ICT Digital and Customer for Liverpool City Council. I came back there in January. I did work there for 17 years beforehand, but I've been away and I worked at Wigan and Bolton Council um, as head of the strategic ICT partnership. And I also had some time at St. Hel Helens Council. So it's great to be coming back to Liverpool. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the city. It's a big city, loads of tourism. Um, you might detect a slight twinge of a northern accent as I'm presenting. Just a slight twinge that tells you where I'm from. Well, for me, it, it is like coming home. So I've had lots of experience, 30 years plus experience working in local government and um, of 
looking at what is the best strategy for ICT in that environment, how do we utilise the developments in, in technology that are taking place, how do we make that relevant for our citizens. So loads and loads of experience of the practical delivery of ICT on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm also Vice President of Socketum, one of the Vice Presidents of Socketum. Um, this is my second year as Vice President. Um, I took on the role because Socketon plays such a major part in terms of um, advice, guide and support and resources for local government. Um, it was a really useful organisation for me when I first took on my, my role in ICT and I did want to give something back. And my theme within um, my, my, my role as VP is modernising ICT service delivery and that's really important I think because the day-to-day -day job is so much more than just business as usual and I'll talk a little bit about me about that as we go through my, my short presentation. So my next slide, gosh, gosh, it's been a tough job leading ICT and local government, particularly over the last few months. I think we've been tested like we've never been tested before. We've had a massive role to play in terms of supporting residents through a very difficult time and a massive role in terms of keeping those services running. And ICT has kind of really stepped up to the forefront and played a major role in in the support we've offered to residents. Um, so, you know, it has been a really challenging time, managing expectations, setting up new systems around um, some of the new challenges, supporting people, the isolation payments, the business grants, all of the things that have been asked of us. It's been a really, really challenging time. And um, doing a lot of new stuff um, for the first time and kind of, of testing that out and doing it really, really quickly. And against that, you know, we've got all of the demands of running the service day to day. So it has been, you know, a, a really challenging time and a time when we've had to look some of our really key partners and suppliers around how they can support us through this difficult time. So in terms of my next slide and modernising ICT service delivery, why did I choose this as a topic? I think because we're recognising that for... Um, ICT managers in local government, heads of IT, ICT directors, the role is becoming so much more challenging um, over the last few years. We've got, we live in a 24-7 world, don't we? We do no longer have the luxury of time where we can take our services offline and spend time testing upgrades and working through upgrades. Our suppliers historically, you know, have, have not always kept to pace with, with some of the technology. Um, and we've been playing catch up a lot of the time and some of our core legacy business systems um, have needed to really up their game in terms of, of delivery and managing those expectations. I think it's a challenge for us, the increasing consumerization of ICT and the expectations of residents and our staff around what we, we can deliver and how quickly we can respond to changes in that technology. I think the cyber security landscape is becoming increasingly complex and we as custodians of customer data have massive responsibilities in terms of keeping that safe, how we manage that data. And yeah, wanting to do things that are really transformational and, and to embrace you know, the opportunities around new technology at the same time. We've seen significant changes in work styles amongst um, our, our workforce. I think that there was a view that local authorities were not necessarily up for new ways of working, but I think we've demonstrated that that's not the case. And we really now are seeing our staff work in very different day, day ways, taking technology out to um, citizens on the front line, um, not working in a really agile way, sharing data with a range of public sec sector partners and really seeing a change in how in how we deliver services and for an ICT leader that you know is is a really challenging agenda that we, we've got to work with. I think for us as well we've seen an increasing um, dependency and an, an increasing use in the private sector of data and analytics it's a really people say that data is the new oil don't they or in terms of 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 how you use that and how you use it to develop your business and i think for local authorities we've not necessarily um made as much use of data historically um 
as 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 we could have done and i think now particularly with some of the recent publicity around data and algorithms and the role it's played in in terms of managing the pandemic i think we really need to up our game and do more around that and i think our chief execs in our organization are challenging us to come up with more ways to um, embed data to help us predict service demand to help us manage our resources more effectively all of those types of things we're seeing more and more of that um happening you know more and more of that happening on a regular basis um so in terms of my next slide around challenges and opportunities we as, as heads of it and local government are seeing um the recent pandemic has, has kind of really seen our citizens start to use technology in a very different way. And I think all of us are seeing that our staff um, are, you, are seeing it used more in terms of how they engage with their families. We've seen a massive change in the way citizens interact with us. And I think it's really helped dispel some of the myths about things that you can or cannot do with citizens and things that, um, that, that they won't embrace. We've seen a huge growth in how our citizens have engaged with us digitally. And our citizen digital experience is becoming increasingly more important to us. And that's an area that we've been working with Splunk around to try and see how we can um, really look at the metrics around this and how we can do as much as we can to, to enhance that experience. I think we've already talked about data and the opportunities around data. And I think one of the things we recognise is that given that our IT services are significantly challenged in terms of the, the amount of resources that we've got, the financial challenges we face, which are going to get even worse given the, um, the, the situation we faced with the pandemic, I think we need to do as much as we can to maximise um, the way we use our resources in delivering an ICT service. So how can we be more proactive in terms of managing demand from our, 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 our customers and our staff in terms of what they want from us? How can we be more proactive in terms of of how we use data to make sure that we target our resources in the most effective way? I think some of the challenges that we've seen over recent times is, is the, the sudden massive shift towards remote working and also a new model of hybrid working and what that's going to mean for us. We're not necessarily very well equipped in local authorities to cope with um, hybrid meetings and hybrid management of staff. We kind of, we've embraced really the, the presenteeism approach or the remote approach and we've now got to try and come to terms with um, a more hybrid model and what does that look like and what does our kind of um, delivery of IT services look like in response to that. I think we're seeing an increased focus on performance monitoring. Our, our IT service is going to have to, we've been historically very much focused on monitoring staff who are working from our buildings using our networks and now we're seeing a massive shift to a whole load of staff who are working in a very different way and the monitoring that we need to do as a service is around um you know what's happening in the wider community what's happening with the networks that people are using to access our systems what um you know kind of what does that community performance look like what does the performance of teams look like a whole load of different things that have become massively more important in terms of how we manage the delivery of that service and the way we support staff through our service desk is changing massively. We've still, as I said, got the financial pressures that we need to deal with. And I think we're conscious as well that as a result of the new models of working, we're seeing a real difference in security challenges around um, how people are accessing our systems and how people are using our data. Our security footprint, if you like, is massively extended as a result of the new models of working. So we need to look at massively more proactive ways of, of managing that security footprint. So in terms of my next slide and the problem we need to solve, which is a little bit what, about what we were going to talk about in this webinar, um, very much about how do we make a better use of our scarce resources? How can some of the new technology and some of the new tools help us to better manage the demand on our service and get a bit more for less in terms of the resources we've got deployed uh, delivering our ICT service. 
how do we do more proactive monitoring of our um, performance and our security footprint, recognising that we've got a whole load of staff working in, in, in lots of different places, rather than, as I said, being, being a more physically present workforce. Um, how, do, how do we get a better understanding of the security issues associated with this? We're all see, so seeing a massive increase in the, um, the customers who are engaging with us digitally. And we've got, um, we need to capitalize on this. So we need to know a lot more about what their digital experience is like. Um, how, how are we performing in terms of their interactions with us? What can we do to improve that experience? If you're going to interact with us in that way, we have to know that it's a good experience. So what tools are there out there that can help us do with this? And they were the kind of problems that we set and we've been saying to Splunk, work with us, help us look at how we can solve some of those problems. And they're going to go on in the next slide um, to talk a little bit about um, how they helped us with some of those problems. So I'll hand you over to them. Hello and good morning, everyone, uh, and a big welcome to this next part. Uh, thank you, Alison, uh, and thank you, uh, Dean. Uh, my name's Kev Pyatt, and before we get started on this next part, which is all going to be about how we leverage the power of data when it comes to what a lot of people are calling uh, the new normal. Um, I'm not sure I was ever normal to begin with, to be honest. But before we start, a little bit about me. Uh, I started the early part of my career in the Air Force. Um, and I signed up as a telecommunication specialist looking at radar, radio, um, satellite communications, and IT. And my first posting was down at the Joint Support Unit Caution, uh, where we were tasked with cybersecurity looking across all of the tri services. Uh, so I was really interested in that space. So I left the military and um, I stayed within the public sector, uh, working on some networks down in London for, for central government. Uh, and then eventually spending the latter part uh, of the past 10 years um, of my cyber uh, security career working out of the Foreign Office, um, heading up their cyber security centre. Um, towards the end of that tenure, uh, we transitioned to Splunk to help us with our cyber operations. And I love the product so much, uh, I ended up joining the company, uh, joined Splunk towards the end of last year, sort of November, just before all of the, this corona virus sort of kicked off. So without further ado, um, let's get started. So this one's to quickly satisfy the legal department. During this presentation, we may look uh, make forward looking statements. Uh, I'm not really going to read the, the whole thing out there, but I will leave it up for a few moments. Um, however, if I do reference road mapped items, please do bear in mind they are subject uh, to change. Uh, and Splunk reserve the right to do so. So having just listened in to, to Alison uh, and Dean, I think we can all probably relate that these questions that are displayed here uh, are typical questions that either us or our team face daily. Uh, and I'm also sure that we can all agree that these typical questions are often difficult to answer, uh, even more so uh, when we're asked to provide answers in real time. So modern times, uh, I didn't really want to say unprecedented, I think we've all heard that enough recently, um, have meant that, that we've all been forced to move fast, uh, often trampling over our change process 
And we've even seen a, a more fluid, agile approach to our working environment. So working from home is now the new office. Uh, more and more applications are now hosted in the cloud. Uh, and customers are also changing the way they interact with us, uh, opting for online methods over face-to-face. -face. So if we take a little uh, look a little deeper, uh, we can probably sort of silo those questions into more uh, four more four main areas. So that's sort of agile workforce. Um, do our workforce have connectivity? Um, are the tools they need to do their job still available? Uh, are they, do they remain available? Uh, are there any issues with them? Um, are our staff collaborating with each other? Um, moving through to security, are we the subject of a cyber attack? Is our data still our data? Um, can we reduce detection and investigation time? Monitoring, what is our underlying infrastructure telling us? What is our VPN telling us? Uh, what's the connection saturations like? Um, is it still available? Customer experience, uh, response times. I mean, put your hands up, uh, virtual, of course. Uh, if you abandon your web session, if things are taking too long, um, I know I do. Um, and what are our customers doing on our website? What's that journey that they're taking? How are they transiting through our website, ultimately having an effect on the experience that they have? <laughs> And that's sort of where we come in. So Splunk gives us the ability to answer our questions with data, uh, allows us to make decisions and take actions all based on what our data is telling us. In essence, taking the guesswork out of monitoring and securing our IT systems. Once we have sent our unstructured data to Splunk, it's quick to gain insight from it using some of our out of the box applications, such as this particular one I'm gonna talk a few moments about now called Remote Work Insights. <laughs> With just a few data types, such as authentication, VPN, and video conferencing, we can see that our staff are connecting, collaborating, and have the tools they require to do their job. We can see if there are any issues that are causing problems for our remote workforce. And if we are seeing any patterns that look abnormal, perhaps that's a security issue. Uh, are we expecting our user to be logging in from the States, for instance, so we can see from the geographic map towards, towards the bottom? Um, all sort of useful keys, useful information, useful insight to know what's going on while our workforce are not within our office buildings anymore. Which brings us nicely through to security. We have applications uh, which we can install onto Splunk, which can help you put a security lens on your data, such as the InfoSec app, uh, the Security Essentials app, and the Security Monitoring app, to name but a few. Um, the important thing to note is we have over 400 security use cases, which can be adapted and modified to give you real-time alerting, reports, or dashboard panels. Uh, and that can help you identify any patterns, peaks, and troughs in your data, uh, identify any abnormalities with behavior with users. And those alerts can all be sent to either a Splunk console. Uh, they can be emailed to you, um, a message sent to a Slack or a Microsoft Teams channel. Uh, you can receive an SMS on your phone, or you can even get automated raising of tickets in your ticket platform of choice. The great thing about Splunk is that we see all data as security relevant, and we have already mentioned the monitoring of three data types using the Remote Work Insights app, such as VPN, uh, authentication, and data from our video teleconferencing suite. Um, and if we just take one of those examples, such as VPN, um, the Remote Work Insight app is telling us how our users VPN, how VPN is coping, where they're accessing it from. However, if we flip that on its head and look at that from a security context, we can start to look at, are they concurrent sessions? So uh, we wouldn't expect a user to be running duplicate VPN sessions, especially coming from um, different locations across the globe. That could well be a security issue. Or whether a user logs in from one location followed by another location uh, in a short space of time, which would mean an unrealistic travel time. For instance, you can't get from London to Beijing within an hour, um, not, not in the modern day anyway. So this is what we call data reuse, where we're ingesting one data type to fulfill multiple use cases, often across the spectrums of security, IT operations, and business analytics. So not only now are we able to alert when things happen, we can look at the behavioral side of security and detect patterns as well. 
such as an increase in usage of a particular protocol, uh, a user that's suddenly starting to access more uh, endpoints than they usually do, or indeed a spike in a certain alert type. We can start to look at patterns as well, which really sort of takes that away from the human eye and, and lets Splunk do that work for us. Monitoring usage and infrastructure uh, to ensure investments are made in the correct areas. Um, so what is adoption looking like? Um, are we on the correct license for something like Office 365? There's data here displayed for that. Are our users fully utilizing SharePoint online? Uh, are they using MS Teams, Exchange? Uh, if you've developed any pool of custom apps within Azure, we can, we can see that too. Uh, so it helps you just make sure that you're on the correct license, making sure your spend is correct, and making sure the services that you're providing are being utilized. And in essence, uh, asking the question, could we cut back if we need to? Um, and then looking a little more internally, looking at sort of something like Active Directory data, uh, who's creating and modifying groups in Active Directory, uh, user accounts being created uh, or dropped into administration groups, uh, how can we check that out? We can do that very easily from within Splunk. Uh, have there been any changes to group policy? Uh, what were those changes and who made them? Um, you can answer those questions very quick, which can speed up investigation times and help you get to the root cause analysis to help you rectify those issues. And moving on to the sort of last area of monitoring is looking at your infrastructure. Is it performing well? Do we have enough resources? Do we have too much resource on certain entities? Could we perhaps co-locate applications on servers that have spare capacity rather than standing up uh, a new server? Uh, I know particularly in my past life, it was normally a new application, new server, uh, and typically that's seen as a, as a waste of resource in this day and age. Moving on to sort of another area, so sort of the business analytics side, uh, this particular app is called uh, Splunk for Web Analytics. Um, and the Liverpool digital team were interested in tool consolidation. They currently have multiple tools, um, for instance, Google Analytics, amongst a few others. Uh, and they're interested in consolidating that down into a single tool set, uh, such as Splunk, in order to give them that fully coherent view as to what's happening with their web-facing applications in order to help speed up some of, getting the answers to some of the questions that they're asking of their data. Um, so they're sort of monitoring uh, for things such as like uh, latency, uh, response times, uh, and even web-based abuse from all within a single pane of glass. And that all important sort of area that we've touched on briefly is what, what, what are our users doing with our website? How are they uh, interacting with us? What's their journey? And that's where this sort of nice Sankey diagram comes in. Uh, understanding the interaction as well as the performance on the websites for them is key. Uh, and all this is possible from within Splunk. Monitoring log files from Apache web servers or IIS web servers uh, using a lightweight agent that we call a universal forwarder. Uh, so what we've actually just discussed is we've now got two areas of the business using a single platform. So that really helps you gain further value from a single tool set, uh, while also enabling that cross-knowledge share across the different departments. Um, when everyone's using the same tool, using the same language, using the same uh, application, it's easy to sort of grow in knowledge across the team uh, without having to use separate silos uh, to get the answers. So a few key takeaways from sort of the first area of my, my chat today is um, we're able to give you that fast time to value. Uh, we have an application, we can set it up in the cloud, uh, and that can be ready within a matter of hours. There's a lot of out-of-the-box integration. Um, I've mentioned a few applications today, but we have like our app store available online, which is called Splunk Base. Uh, there's over 2,000 applications on there, and they're ranging from anything from technology applications to help you get data in from certain flavors of firewall or uh, IIS servers, for instance, uh, help Splunk understand what that data There's no reinventing the wheel. Uh, right the way through to bespoke alert actions. So there's apps for sending alerts to Microsoft Teams, for instance, or there's even sort of customized visualization. So if there's not a visualization that comes out of the box with the standard install of Splunk, you can bet your bottom dollar that uh, there'll be one on Splunk base. The, the ability to ingest any data. So as long as that data is human readable data, ASCII 2 data, 
uh, and is not a video or a sound wave, we can ingest it and we can make sense of it. And there is a multiple ways that we can get that data. We can use our agent that I've already mentioned. Uh, we can listen on ports, streams. We can put a scripted input on uh, to, to, to run a script such as sort of PowerShell to go and get data for us, or we can even use APIs. Uh, Role-based access control is normally an important one, especially with the Liverpool guys. Uh, we're currently working with their ICT team and also Liverpool Digital, as I've already mentioned. Uh, and the ICT team were keen to make sure that Liverpool guy digital team only had access to the data they required in order to do their job, which is all based around sort of the web data. Um, so what we've got is we have multiple data indexes that we call them in Splunk. Uh, and we have the Liverpool digital team able to access the web data, while the ICT team is able to access all data. And that is all completely customizable. Um, by you guys. And the last piece is really harness the power of data. Um, I mean, without data, um, you really can make solid decisions and uh, complete better actions when you're using data to sort of get you those answers to those all important questions. I sort of use the analogy of sort of playing Texas Hold'em poker. For instance, it's, you can make a, a best guess with the hand that you have on your hand and the cards that you have on the table as to whether you're ahead or behind. However, if you could see everyone else's cards, I have the data, you, you knew, you'd know when to throw your cards and you knew, you'd know when you were beat or you'd know when, when, when to play strong, you know when you're in a position of strength. And that brings me nicely on to, to another piece. So uh, myself and Ollie Hewitt, who is the Splunk uh, local government account manager here in the UK, we've been working with one of our partners, um, delivery partners, as well as Softcat, to come up with a nice package around sort of protecting the perimeter uh, what we're seeing out in the market is that um, people want to start with cybersecurity, but as we all know, it's a vast area. Uh, having worked in that sort of field myself for, for, for nearly sort of 13, 14 years, um, and I personally think it's about just uh, sticking that stick in the ground and making a start and a, and a strong start at that, which is where we've come up with this idea of protecting the perimeter. And let's dig a little deeper in there. Um, and what we've come up with is a, a highly scalable SaaS solution. Uh, data is sent and stored securely in the cloud. Uh, we are looking to monitor six key areas of business. So we're looking to monitor anything that sort of enters and leaves your network. So a VPN, uh, proxy, email. Um, we're looking at antivirus traffic, uh, your edge firewalls, and cloud technology such as Office 365. Uh, there's at minimum 17 available out of the box dashboards, some of which we've looked at today uh, in the screenshots. We have 26 uh, security use cases that we're able to deliver, which I think is a really great start, especially if you're making your making your first steps into a, a sort of seam like solution. Uh, going from zero to 26 potential alerts uh, is quite good, and that's not where it ends. Um, you have the ability to grow and adopt, and, and we can talk you through, through how you do that. And this package is pitched at 50 gigabytes per day ingest. So that's how much sort of security relevant log information we can ingest into Splunk to make use of. A quick look at what those security use cases look like. I'm not going to read all these out, but uh, there, there, there's a lot here uh, in, in order to sort of take your eye away from it. So allow Splunk to monitor the stuff that's seen here on the screen. Uh, that will empower you, give you more time back to go off and do other things, which makes sort of you more efficient as a team. Uh, and again, um, we, as I mentioned previously, we have about 400 use cases out of the box. This is sort of where we're saying we should perhaps concentrate our initial efforts. But going on from there, there's, there's the option to grow and sort of further down the line, if you want to progress into sort of uh, machine learning and sort of advanced analytics, then that is all possible from within a single platform. And that is it for me today. I look forward to potentially any questions towards the end of the day, but uh, thank you for your time. And I'll now hand back to the guys at Softcat. Thank you for that, Kev. And um, thank you, Dean and Alison, as well. That was great. Um, we do, like I said, um, have a Q&A tool um, showing on the dashboard, which you can use to submit any questions. Um, from what I can see, we don't have any uh, questions that have come through at the moment. So. I'll probably look to start wrapping up, but if anything, if I do see anything come through whilst wrapping up, then obviously I'll, I'll go through those. 
Um, so I uh, just wanted to remind you that there is um, going to be a recording of this webinar sent to you within the next day or two, so you can go back to that. It will also be hosted on our website in the next week or so, so you can watch it back on demand. Um, just noticed a question come through, so I'm going to go through that now um, before I continue to wrap up. So um, I will just uh, direct that towards all three of you, your, the speakers today, um, and then whoever feels it's relevant can pick it up. So um, first question is, if Splunk flags issues, would it recommend a resolution or even resolve it itself? So yeah, I'm happy to take that one. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll video back on. I was afraid of it sort of affecting my bandwidth. Um, great question, uh, Faz. And the answer to it is, I'm going to say, depends. Uh, it's an answer that I typically throw around. Whereas the, the out of the box use cases do have uh, next steps that we can build into your content. So if something does fire, we can have uh, next steps built in where they are visible and you're able to follow them through. Uh, but on top of that, there are some automated actions we can do. Uh, we do have our security orchestration and automated response tool called Phantom, uh, but we don't typically recommend that for customers unless they are very mature in their processes and procedures. Um, and what we opt for is perhaps dip our toe into automated actions. So, for instance, um, certain firewall vendors have developed applications for Splunk where we can take an IP address and tag it to a dynamic uh, address list on the firewall, which could be tied to a block rule. So for instance, if we're seeing port scanning hit our firewall, Splunk can detect that, take the source IP, pop it on the dynamic address list and stop that in its tracks. So I hope that's answered your question, but it would be great to sort of potentially dig a little deeper and see where you're looking to automate and, and save time. Thank you for that, Kev. Um, doesn't look like we've had any more questions through, but as I was uh, just mentioning, we, um, you, if you do have any other questions after the webinar, um, you can um, send them through to us using our marketing email pot, so that's marketing at softcat.com, um, and then we can pass it on to the re relevant person for you, or even better, if you've got a Softcat account manager, do, um, do not hesitate to send questions through to them as well. Um, we will be, as mentioned, uh, having a follow-up um, after the webinar, so you'll get a recording. Um, but also, you know, we can go back on any of those questions as well as needed. Um, just uh, to wrap up now, just because we've got no more questions, um, there is a post-webinar survey on the console where you can let us know how you found the content. We would love to get your feedback. Um, that will also show up once the webinar ends on your screen. Um, thanks again to everyone for joining and staying right to the end, and to Dean, Alison, and Kev for speaking on the webinar today. Um, we hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you.